Thanks everyone. So I'm here today to talk to you about access to public transport. Um, in a second I'll talk to you a bit more about what that means and don't get your hopes up that this is going to be one magic number that will tell you all about access to public transport. It's a little bit more complex than that. Here's a pretty map to start us off. Um, not going to talk to it right now, we'll come back around to that at the end, but eh, enjoy. <laughs> so, I want everyone to think carefully about this question, don't just brush over it. How close do you live to a bus stop, train station or ferry terminal? Just have a think. And how often is that stop served by a bus, ferry or train? Every 10 minutes, every hour, once a day. These are things that affect your travel decisions. A um, couple more there, how far can you get on public transport in 45 minutes? So once you get on that bus or ferry or train, where can you get to? There's probably a, a limit to how long you want to spend traveling. I've used 45 minutes, but it'll be different for all of us. And lastly, how reliable is that public transport? Does it take half an hour one day and an hour the next? Again, those are the things that will affect your decisions. If it takes an hour once a week, you'll probably always assume it's going to take an hour because often enough it actually does. So what we're going to focus on today is the first two points here. Uh, yeah, This is me. <laughs> so um, as Richard mentioned, I'm a public transport planner and a data science scientist. Um, my work involves lots of report writing, but also lots of data analysis, economics, playing with numbers, playing with maps. And the number crunching is really what makes me happy. So <laughs> that's a little bit about me. Um, oh, image is a bit skewed, but the company I work for is called MR Cagney, and we do public transport, urban design, and urban planning. Um, basically, we work to make places better for people, and that's what really drives me. So it's great that I get to actually work at a place that you know does the same things I want to do. <laughs> All right, so a little bit about today's talk. Like I said at the start, there is no magic number that tells you how good public transport is. There are a few, a, a few different factors, and we focused on one of them for a project we did with NZTA, and it was about how many people in urban centres have access to frequent public transport. Um, I've simplified the problem we used for NZTA today so that it's a bit easier and faster to get through. Uh, we had a couple of different thresholds for them, and we separated frequent from rapid, so frequent just means it comes frequently, and rapid typically means it comes frequently, it goes fast, it doesn't stop every 300 meters, it's sort of, the stops are more like one kilometer or two kilometers spaced, so your journey overall is a lot faster on rapid transit. Um, so there are a couple of different aspects, these relate back to the questions I asked you at the start. The first is about mobility or freedom, and that's how far you can get in a set amount of time. Uh, the next one down is about accessibility, and it's about what amenities or utilities are in that area. So how many supermarkets can you get to? How many movie theaters, malls, ch uh, shops, or bakeries, or anything like that? Um, so it's about your access to things that are meaningful to you. And the last one is reliability, which is a huge thing, and it's really exciting, but we don't have time to talk about today. <laughs> so this is our, uh, I guess, project question. How many people live within 500 meters walk of public transport? Content, so there are kind of two things I'm trying to get out of today and hopefully I can get through it all. One is about the key things I learned doing this project. So the importance of collaboration and transparency and just working with the end user to make sure you understand the purpose of what you're doing. The second is providing meaningful outputs along the way. So. In one instance, we provided an output, and NZTA came back and they were like, hang on, this doesn't seem right. And we were like, oh, we should show you the workings. We should show you the step before. And the third one is about knowing the limitations of your tools, and I'll get to that later on. And then to walk you through these kind of three learnings, I'm just going to talk you through the project, basically. To start with, we had some data. We did some data cleaning. Then we processed the data. Um, yeah, processed public transport data, there's a lot involved in that. I'm going to kind of brush over it, but hopefully it gives you a little bit of exposure. And then to end with, we collected the walking catchments and did some computations on that. Cool, so we had three main pieces, pieces of data involved in this project. The first is public transport data. So I'm not sure 
hands up who's used public transport data in GTFS? Cool, nice. Um, so we did this project in Python and we used a package called GTFS Kit. It was formerly called GTFS TK. And it's developed by a colleague of mine. And it's great, would highly recommend it. And uh, you can come to the experts if you need any help with it. Uh, the second piece of data is about the street network. I think we all know about OpenStreetMap. We've been hearing a lot about it in the last couple of days if you didn't know about it before. <laughs> um, and we used a Mapbox API to collect walking catchments from OpenStreetMap. And the final one is population estimates because we were interested in who lives in those catchments and how many people there are. And that was from Statistics New Zealand. Okay, so going to do a little bit of code here as well for those of you that that's useful for. Um, quickly going to highlight three of the main packages we used. So the first was GTFS kit, which I just mentioned. The second is routing pi, which is a really cool Python package for connecting to APIs to a bunch of different services to get routes or walking catchments or a whole range of things. Uh, it's kind of hard to find if you don't know about it, so it's on GitHub, it's just called Routing Pi. And the last one is called Folium, which is an interface to leaflet. Cool, some more code. Again, I wonder, is this plugged in? Ah, so let's see, I'll point you to the key points here, which is, here, GTFS kit. So the main reason I put this code up in the first place is to show you how easy it is to read the GTFS files in. You just give it the path to the, to the zip file and it reads it all and it processes it all. And then you run this really easy clean method and it kind of cleans up all of the common data inconsistencies. Oh yeah, and then we had to do some extra cleaning based on the custom requirements for our project. I'm sure we're all familiar with that. <laughs> Which brings us to lesson number one for me, which was what is clean data depends on the project requirements. So in this case, um, some bus routes might have different numbers, but maybe they're almost identical and for the purposes of the project, you want to assume they're actually the same route. Those kinds of things. Cool, so stage two of the process is how to work with the GTFS data. What can we do with it? So this part, while GTFS and public transport is all geospatial data, um, this is kind of just number crunching, really. All we wanted to do is figure out which stops have frequent bus routes. Oh, was there anything else there? Yeah. And then we mapped it all and checked it with the clients, and that was part of the providing interim outputs and making sure that they were satisfied with what we were doing as we went, rather than just giving them something at the end. Cool. So more code. This bit of code isn't as useful because it's some hidden methods that I don't have on the slides. But basically, this is what we used to come up with a table <coughs> of all of the frequent stops. So this was just what we used to then feed into our routing API to work out our isochrones. What's more exciting is the mapping of it. Um, again, providing the code for those of you that maybe haven't used Folium yet but are interested. Uh, at the top, it's an awkward angle. Anyway, at the top is how we define sort of the base settings for a map. So we just give it where to start, how much to be zoomed in. And then the rest of that is basically just adding circle points to the leaflet map. And then the map was meant to show. <laughs> but I'll tell you what it looked like. So this was a map of Wellington because I thought that was appropriate because we're in Wellington. And initially we provided NZTA with a map with a set of blue dots all over it. And that showed you which stops had frequent bus routes on them. And that was all great. But they came back to us and said, actually there's a route here that's missing and a, and a route over here that's also frequent. And they were basing this off of the tr public transport maps that you know, say these are your frequent routes and these are your less frequent routes. So we went back to the data and all the data processing we did and we were like, ah, oh, you thought it was frequent, so you thought it came every 15 minutes. But sometimes it comes every 16 minutes or 17 minutes. So that's kind of a challenge of having a fixed threshold and a fixed definition. But we worked with them and they agreed that they wanted to keep that fixed def definition. But to help them understand the outputs they were getting, we get gave them a second map with blue and red dots. <laughs> and so in this case, the red dots highlighted everything that wasn't frequent. 
and you could hover over it and say, ah, okay, this is root number two, and it sometimes only comes every 17 minutes, or whatever it was that made it push out of the threshold. Anyway, it would have been more exciting to see the map. That brings us to lesson number two that I learned, and I'm sure some of you have learned these lessons in your own careers. But that was about showing the client the workings and not just the outputs. So yeah, initially they weren't very happy and they were like, you've missed a whole bunch of bus stops. But then when we showed them all of the interim steps, they were kind of like, actually, that's okay. And if we, if, we really mean that, if we really mean that this metric is important and that we want people to have access to a bus every 15 minutes, then we're, gonna, we're not gonna change the metric to fit you know, the schedules that aren't quite right. And that brings us to lesson number three about having definitions and fixed thresholds. So, I mean, one thing you might want to do is who, how many people have access to a bus at least every 10 minutes and then every 15 and then every 20. And if you've got sort of a set of thresholds and you can look at all of them side by side, you can kind of see, yeah, I guess, how many routes get added into that set when you give a bit more of a time allowance to what it means by frequent. Cool, and then the final part of the process that we went through was about collecting the walking catchments. This was re the really exciting part that I hadn't done before, which was using routing pi um, to make API, API calls through Mapbox. Um, this was exciting because I had never used APIs before. <laughs> so um, it's something I'm getting very excited about now that I'm like starting to delve into that because it's so powerful. Anyway, you all know that. Um, and then the final step was actually computing the population within those catchments to get sort of the big number that we were looking for in the end. Cool, so a little bit more code here. Um, the bottom three lines is what's really exciting, and this is how you use the routing pi package to make those API calls, to make that interface. Um, so basically the first one there is saying which um, method we want to use it's the Mapbox Valhalla isochrone method and the API key. And the next two are basically just saying, let's just bypass the errors and see what comes out at the end. And then this one is basically a big for loop where we send Mapbox each point one by one and get the isochrones back from Mapbox. Um, it's just more code, really. <laughs> The exciting part probably won't show because there's a map coming up. <laughs> um, so again, I've got the code up here to make the map, but it's almost exactly the same code as last time. You do your setup at the start for, hey, I'm making a map, and then you load the features and just add them to the map. Oh, it loaded. Cool. So this was the map I showed you all at the start, and these are the 500 meter walking catchments from all of the bus stops in Wellington that have frequent public transport. So that's at least one bus every 15 minutes. Um, this was, let's see how well it works. Yeah, so this was provided to NZTA. And again, because the key output was just a number about what is the population that has this access, we didn't make this super pretty. It was really an exploratory tool. Um, but it let them ha have a look and sort of say, oh, OK, these people have access. The uh, maximum gap between services was 12 minutes and it's route number two. Um, and this was another spot where they kind of picked up, hang on, isn't there meant to be a route over here? Don't these people have access over here? Um, yeah. So that was all very exciting. Ah. Cool, and then we kind of went into the bit that excites people less because it's, there's no, there are no more maps and we're back to just number crunching. Um, but we just dissolved that all into one polygon and ran an intersection with mesh blocks and spat out the population with access to frequent public transport. Um, this was interesting because this was a repeat project from last year and we found a couple of bugs in what we did last year and had to come back and some of the numbers didn't go the way they should have. So we would have thought all the numbers would increase and a couple went down a little bit. Um, but we think we caught all of the bugs this time. So going forwards, hopefully everything moves in the right direction. But this is, yeah, this is part of an annual metric that NZTA is going to be reporting on. So it's quite exciting to have been able to automate it and just automate all this map, map creation that we can just give to them and is really easy for them to interrogate. 
and we got a number spat out at the end. So for anyone who's interested <laughs> in Wellington, I think this is the 2013 populations because we did it with 2013 and 2018 estimates. Um, but there were 78,411 people with access to frequent public transport. See, no one's excited by that, but like people are excited by the maps. <laughs> Um, this brings us to lesson number four, which is that the catchments change if someone updates OpenStreetMap. So I learned this because my colleague ran all of the code, and then he went away on leave, and the next week I ran all the code and got a slightly different number. It was like 200 extra people that had access all of a sudden, and I was kind of like, oh, how did that happen? And like loaded all of the polygons together, and I was like, they all look the same, and zoomed in somewhere, and I was like, ah, there's like a tiny little bit of extra catchment in this one spot because someone added footpaths in. So that's great, and that's what we like about OpenStreetMap is it's constantly evolving and having, like, being updated. But it's a little bit of a problem for like, reproducibility and just checking that everything's running as it should. Uh, so it was something to be aware of, and there are obviously other ways we could do it, like downloading the OSM data and running things on our desktops, but the API calls were convenient and sort of pros and cons. Once you know that it's a, a thing to be aware of, it's not such a big problem. And lesson number five is that if you update OpenStreetMap, it takes a couple of days to like feed through to Mapbox. And I apologize, I'm sure someone here knows a lot more about this than me because I didn't really look into it. But all I know is I like updated OpenStreetMap and just you know, checked it every day until it was update, updated and then reran my code. And that was fine because we were like ahead of schedule. But if it had been something where it was like, we need this now, yeah, that would have caused some problems and you'd have to go back to sort of downloading the OSM data directly and, and running everything on your local desktop. Um, so this was really useful for me, just learning, yeah, thinking more about the tools that you're using and what the sort of pros and cons of that are. Cool, so how does this affect all of you? Like, why did you come and listen to me today? Partially, I hope that you maybe can like rewatch this video or, or use these slides and, and the code might help you in the future. Um, and partially, I guess, I just wanted to go back to my key learnings, which were about thinking about data in the context of the project. So just because data is clean doesn't mean it's useful for your client or the end user. Um, always providing interim outputs. Don't wait till they're asked for. Like, if you create it for your own sense checks, just give it to the next person as well. They'll either use it or they won't, but at least they have the option. Uh, and yeah, be really aware of the limitations of your tools. Luckily, it didn't affect us in a negative way, but it's just useful to think about. Cool, this is me again, and I would be super happy to stay in touch with everyone, so there's my email. Thank you. Any questions from the audience? Nice talk. Um, I've got two questions. Um, the first one was when you define frequent services, are you only taking peak hours into account? So the purpose of journey is for commuting, and that's where you're seeing even some variability with some of the services just being slightly off. Um, yeah, so we actually ran the analysis twice. Once was for peak hours, well, for the morning peak, so between 7 and 9 a.m., and so that was for basically commuting purposes, and then one was from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., and so that was looking at all-day frequency. Uh, which So we did this for Auckland, Wellington, and Christchurch, and Auckland was okay, and Wellington and Christchurch weren't great for the like all-day frequency, but yeah. Um, that's something, I guess, by reporting on both of those, we can get a good feel for how we're serving commuters as well as how we're serving everyone. Totally, and the second question was when you do the population um, within the catchments. If there's a mesh block that's not completely within your bus catchment polygons, do you only take part of whatever is the fraction that's within, or is it the yeah. whole mesh block? Yeah, we just yeah we just take the fraction that our catchment intersects with, and we kind of assume there's like a uniform distribution of people living in the mesh blocks. But that's, yeah, the level of data we have. Yeah. I was wondering about that point three of a person. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah, when you looked at the walking catchment, did you take into consideration um, vertical also, or just horizontal? Ah, see, that's a good question. I should know the limitations of my tools. Um, I personally don't know. It was using Mapbox Isochrone API, but I think it's just a walking speed applied to the distance. But I could be wrong. Um, I will look that up. <laughs> it's just in Wellington, you can 
Yeah. Yeah. So. We used 500 meters as a distance threshold, but then for the Mapbox API, we converted it to a time based on the like walking speed that Mapbox assumes. Uh, so it's possible that in the background they account for elevation, but I wouldn't count on it. So that's that's a good one to check up on, actually. Yeah. Cool. Uh, that's all. Thank Danielle. Cool. Thank you.